long wait just before the weekend. Uh, so I, I hope uh, you, you have coffee there. On, so if needed, you can do that. So I will do a short introduction of cooperation for autonomous uh, cars. Uh, on, it will not be only uh, between the cars, so my main part of it is between cars, but also cooperation at large, uh, how you can have more cooperation between cars on so to say other objects, I'm from the robotics, so people are objects. And um, so you see I'm from the lab, and that's some features of what we do uh, in the lab uh, for you to know. So some very old uh, autonomous cars, uh, they are more than 20 years old. Uh, we call them uh, cyber cars, so it was made for cities. And so we, are told we have also regular cars, and you see some slab, some communication, some interface, uh, so it's human. Uh, uh, machine interfaces, and we have a cape, uh, uh, on also 3D modeling, uh, uh, and so on. So, the baseline for my talk is uh, that autonomous driving is arriving, uh, and the first elements are being deployed, uh, but we don't probably uh, really well uh, foresee how disruptive uh, a massive introduction of uh, autonomous cars on robots at large uh, will uh, change our society. So we need uh, really to build, uh, in my belief, automated, uh, I would use automated rather than autonomous, um, uh, and cooperative vehicles, because uh, you will see why just in a few slides. And to better understand the challenges of autonomous driving, uh, or if it was really autonomous, uh, is uh, the question is how we can make autonomous vehicle cooperative. Uh, and just to remember that autonomous cars are robots. So I'm from a robotics background. Uh, and so it means uh, there are links with robotics first, with artificial intelligence, of course, but also with big data and smart cities, mobility. There are many, many things. It's a system. One car is a system, but then you have the traffic on mobility system and it's connected to all on the other systems and that's what makes things really difficult it's not just one robot in a plant and it has to do something that's much easier so what is difficult is the system conceptualization and integration so we'll not talk much of it but the idea is to go deeper into some mathematical concepts but still uh, keeping in mind uh, the global vision of that because if you don't have a global vision, you cannot have any consistency on lots of times you have very strange behaviors uh, with robots when uh, you have one layer of the robot trying to do something on another layer trying to do something else. Um, typically it happens with cars. You don't want cars to crash into other cars, so you tend to slow down the cars to keep them safe. But you also want to speed up because you want to be efficient. So you have two conflicting point of views. And if you're not smart, you can have a very strange, uh, very strange behaviors. So a few words uh, about my story stack. Uh, maybe you get the slides afterwards so you can revise it. It's one of the top scientific university in France. So it's a Shanghai ranking. Uh, we had two Nobel Prizes, but it's a very small university. I say it's a university, but there is only 120 students graduating every year. So it's, it's extremely small. And there are deep links with the industry. And so I'm very happy uh, that I'm in a mining uh, building uh, today. Uh, so it won't change uh, me a lot. Uh, the mine spirit was about mining when 200 uh, centuries ago, mining was high tech. Simply. Center for Robotics, uh, there are about uh, 15 professors, 50 people. Uh, we invest uh, in platforms. Uh, so for France, uh, 200. Uh, 1,000 euros per year is a big investment. Usually, labs have much less money. And we have tight links with the industry. So we have a lot of industry academic collaboration. Um, very quickly, we have to do like maybe all labs in the world, teaching, science, innovation. So I, you have the scientific teams. I will talk only about control, but you see there are some other uh, teams. And we apply uh, robotics to, uh, to vehicles, to many cars. So you see big Lara was for La Route Automatisé, the automated road. So we see uh, the road as needing to be automated, not the car themselves. So one example of what we have done so far, 
there was a French competition uh, about uh, robotic exploration of maize, uh, and there were some uh, pattern recognition to do to find, for example, the red ball and so on. And we won twice uh, the competition. On the third year, uh, we were second because the team uh, was already preparing a startup company, so they they didn't want to prepare very seriously the challenge, so they they were second. So and I'm here also because of the chair uh, I'm I'm coordinating. Uh, um, we sponsor uh, uh, Peugeot, so it's car manufacturer. Uh, Safran is more in uh, aeronautics, uh, well known for uh, the engines, uh, plane engines. They are making with General Electric uh, more than half of the engines in the world, uh, so it's a very big company. And Valeo is um, an OEM. Uh, um, we have as partners UC Berkeley, EPFL in Switzerland, uh, uh, Shanghai Jiaotong University, and of course, Mainz Paris Tech. So, we have some budget uh, to do this research, and our goal uh, is to study uh, what would be the future of automated driving uh, on how we can put uh, automated cars within cities. It's much more challenging than uh, uh, freeways. So, I will present some challenges we have to overcome, and then go to the main part, that's a cooperative control and planning uh, problem, on some uh, so a few slides about the decision making part on, on the conclusion. So, some challenges. So you see, uh, we, we are challenged uh, by the traffic today, uh, so we can recognize a typical pattern of traffic. As of today, I believe it's, uh, it's in, this one I believe was in Switzerland with a lake, but uh, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, and you see, one century ago, uh, they were also uh, very challenged by the mobility patterns completely different in terms of patterns, but still uh, uh, people still are using cars, they will still use cars uh, in the foreseeable future uh, for quite a long time, but we can do a lot better. Very clearly, the infrastructure is not well used here, it's empty, it's jammed. So in, typically in communication networks, you, you would do that, you would be, you would be sacked immediately. Uh, so it's uh, such a waste uh, of, uh, of infrastructure. Uh, but how can we do better? That's a question. Um, when you say better, most of the time you think of efficiency meaning speed, your own speed. You don't want to travel uh, a long time, to commute, to take one hour commuting every day. So you want to drive faster. That's the main uh, driver. But there are the other cars most of the time. It's what prevents you from driving faster, but not only. Cars are slowed by interaction, mainly. If you were alone, it would not be a big deal. But you are uh, slowed by the cars in the same direction, that's a traffic jam. But you are also slowed by pedestrian, especially within cities. You have uh, pedestrian uh, crosswalks. Cars in other direction, crossing, uh, it's well known uh, to be uh, um, a stumbling block for traffic management all this traffic light and so on. But also you have to deal with maybe emergency vehicles, buses, so various level of uh, priority, maybe even trains. Um, it's not only uh, about uh, leaving a priority to, to the trains, but also if you want to synchronize, uh, for example, if you do a park and ride or on so, you have to synchronize with the trains if you want to use a multimodal uh, transportation system. Um, it's obvious that in the future, if you have uh, fully autonomous cars, you would like to use them as part of the mobility system. So maybe just take autonomous car going to the BART, for example, then take the BART and then again an autonomous car if you don't want to walk. That would be a possibility. So coordination, coordination is extremely important. So now you can coordinate uh, the system in many, many different ways. So you could uh, enhance either the driving itself, um, it's already done uh, with advanced driver assistance systems, it has up to autonomous driving. So uh, there is a lot being done now in this area. But you can also improve uh, the traffic management by road construction or better either law enforcement, traffic lights, rerouting, and so on, if you do dynamic traffic management, but you could also improve the mobility system 
both for people and for goods. Don't forget there are trucks and that there is a lot of value, economic value, to have uh, logistics being done uh, efficiently. So uh, there are lots of possibilities on uh, engineers and traffic engineers, mobility and people, uh, especially in municipalities and so, they would like to combine uh, all these possibilities to have a very efficient uh, traffic uh, system on mobility system on the world. What I would like to do is only the first item as of today. So I will concentrate on uh, improving uh, uh, the driving itself. So now what is uh, paradoxical in uh, autonomous and cooperative driving? Uh, so problem is uh, if when you say you have an autonomous car, it means all decisions are being taken within the car. So it means you're independent of all other cars. But if you're cooperative, it means there is some consensus anyhow. And so you have to talk to the other and take simultaneously a decision. Um, it means you depend on your own behavior, depends on the behavior of the other people. And so how can you combine independency at one la level and, and cooperativeness at another layer? So it's the question is if you want to have only one optimization criteria, typically your own efficiency, then you can either go for autonomous, so you're selfish, you want to optimize your own trajectory, or for a very uh, cooperative behavior, social, I would say, behavior, but it's, it's, uh, it's really conflicting. It's less conflicting uh, if you remember that you have many uh, different criteria to optimize uh, in an autonomous car. So, of course, you have efficiency, so your speed, uh, or the speed of the traffic flows, but you also have safety, and I told you, they are sometimes conflicting, but you also you want to, to sometimes have a, a well-planned behavior, meaning you know in advance what you want to do, so you plan your behavior, or sometimes you want to be very reactive. When you see a small boy running across the street, you want to be reactive, not just follow your plan. You, can, you would like sometimes to have a centralized system, so municipality would love to have a highly centralized system to monitor completely the system. But sometimes we would like to have a more distributed system because uh, it's more scalable, for example. Also, it's more reactive, usually. Sometimes you're speaking about homogeneous system. So all cars would behave the same way. And sometimes you don't want to have an homogeneous system, so you would like to have an heterogeneous system. And that's a question, of, for example, of standardization. What should be homogeneous? What should not be homogeneous? It's, it's part of the discussion today. And also, you like to be cooperative. Typically, Europe, in European cities, people, or Chinese cities, people tend to be more cooperative because the density is higher. And sometimes you want to be more self-optimized. And everybody wants to be both very social, but also self-optimized. So it's, it's, it's a question of social behavior, fairness. Um, so it's, it's also difficult. But this way, you can solve a little bit uh, this question of how you can combine uh, uh, cooperation and autonomy. So now I go to the main part of the talk, is how you can use these ideas uh, to do some math, then to do some algorithm and to implement into real cars. Because it's very nice to say, okay, I will be par partially cooperative, partially autonomous, but how you can do that? And it's extremely important to do it well uh, because uh, if you're not autonomous, uh, if you're too cooperative, uh, and if there is too much communication between your car and some central uh, management system, uh, it means your car will be driven from the outside of your car. And it's in terms of security, and maybe also safety, uh, it's uh, a big disadvantage. So you need uh, to have at least a core of autonomy in your car to prevent any attacker for example, uh, to uh, have so much control of your car that it could drive, for example, your Jeep, it was a good example, uh, one or two years ago, drive you, your Jeep uh, 100 uh, miles per hour on the highway uh, without stopping uh, in any obstacle. Um, so that's, that's not uh, secure, so you need to have a core that would prevent any crash, uh, whatever happens 
to the rest of the corporation levels. So in terms of software engineering, it's absolutely not trivial to uh, implement smartly all these ideas. But still, in terms of math, uh, there are also some difficulties. So what's planning uh, on uh, what's control? Why I'm talking about planning and control? Because uh, all the autonomous cars I know um, make some plan. So you want, for example, to turn left. There is an incoming uh, vehicle there. So you would uh, probably see some noise. So you have a, a lot of trajectories. Um, so you, it's a robotics, and usually see, plan, act. So you see one car with some noise. You try to do your own uh, plan uh, according uh, to what you see. So it will, there are also some possibilities you can react. And then uh, you do your control. So you follow the trajectory that you have planned. So almost all uh, autonomous cars I know are doing a deterministic plan and they try to follow the plan except if there is a, a safety bridge and then uh, they would change their behavior. But otherwise they would follow very precisely the trajectory that has been planned. So the general recipe is you want to go from here to here and you try to have an optimized trajectory on the most difficult part of the thing is not to optimize the most difficult part is to have a good optimization criteria for that. Problem is a multi-criteria optimization, meaning there is not a single optimum solution. Um, it comes with ideal perception most of the time uh, because it's a deterministic thing. It comes with ideal actions, meaning you completely do what you want to do. It's not true. And very often it's poorly reactive, meaning uh, as soon as I told you, as soon as you have a problem, simply you stop your car, so you brake and you try to replan, uh, but it's, 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 there is not a lot of uh, reactivity in this scheme. But it works pretty well, uh, especially because autonomous cars on, are on the highway most of the time now. And on the highway, uh, it's uh, very predictable what people will do. In the city, it would be much more uh, difficult to, to do that. Control, so now assume that you have planned something. Uh, then the control, you say, OK, I want to follow such a path. So control, uh, do some uh, steering, uh, braking, uh, acceleration. And you can take into account the full uh, dynamics of your car. And then you follow your trajectory. Um, so it's a feedback loop. Um, there are lots of progress in the nonlinear uh, uh, automation, um, it's, it's OK, almost OK now. So what's the challenge of cooperative control? It means you want to drive your own car, but to be reactive uh, and also predictive uh, to the reaction of the other cars. So you see here, some cars are highly, it's not fully blocked because you can exit the cars here, but some buses here are highly non-cooperative. You see that completely blocked the traffic. So how? Most people here have a very reactive driving, meaning if there is a space, they would drive into the space. So, and then you have this kind of blocking. Now, most of the people still have some idea of what they would like to do, how they would like to drive. So we are able, and it's a critical social skill, we are able to combine our reaction, but still to plan, to have some idea of what we want to do on the longer term. So here, it's not difficult. You have to wait. Uh, so what do we do? We both plan and react, uh, but in a way uh, that is very difficult to analyze uh, at first. So since it's too difficult, uh, let's go back to a very simple uh, example. The simplest one where you have still some interaction, so two cars. So what you see is you have a blue car passing by on the white car stops, there is a stop line here, and, and that's all. So first, what do each car see? The first two cars probably see each other very well. And the blue car decided uh, it would go first, and then the white car has acknowledged uh, the blue car would go first. And simply this one say, OK, I'm first, so I can accelerate. So I'm reacting now to my, to my decision. On the way, I said, OK, I have to wait for the blue car. So I stop. And as soon as it's, as it's 
fast intersection, I will accelerate again. Um, so you see both have combined uh, some control part and some planning part of it. But we would like now to divide uh, very precisely what is uh, the control part and what is the planning part. So, in this case, uh, uh, it's extremely simple uh, to explain uh, what happens. Uh, you have only two possibilities for the white car and for the blue car. Either the white car pass before the blue car or after. And there is only two possibilities, so one choice. Um, so finally, here you have the trajectory in the real space. So here blue, here white. Um, if you change uh, your reference frame and you go to the coordination space, uh, then <coughs> very standard uh, change in robotics. Uh, then you take the curvilinear abscissa of vehicle 1, the curvilinear abscissa of vehicle 2, and then you see there is an, uh, an obstacle region, meaning when two cars are the, at, at the same place, then there is a crash, so you should avoid this region, and it means that you have two uh, homotopy classes, one above, one below this obstacle region, and since there are some hypotheses to do that carefully. So first, you believe that your cars will follow a given path. That's a very standard assumption also. It's almost true in real life. Um, also, you always drive uh, forward, and you never go back. And in principle, it's forbidden to go back uh, in a, at an intersection. So it's a, it's a usual also assumption. And then what you can do, since you have discrete Two classes, you have discrete, so you say you have a priority relationship between the cars. Here you see that two is later than car one, so one has precedence over car two, so white, blue, or you could have the right, the, the opposite one. So finally, what it tells us is that, uh, uh, just back up, what it tells us is that. Before, we had a, a very complex space of all possible trajectories, all possible behaviors of the cars, and it's far too big space and to be handled. Um, with this kind of analysis, you can reduce the complexity to a simple binary choice. So that's, that's simple. But you have other possibilities to do. So theoretically, uh, what you can do is simply uh, to get rid of that and say, okay, I want to plan my own trajectory, so the one plan is one trajectory. I ch I'm checking if they are colliding. If they are not colliding, I keep the two trajectories, and that's all. So I take the decision uh, once for all, and I don't care about homotopy classes and so on. It's a possibility. One other possibility is to say, OK, I just want to react. So it works very well for swarms, for example. Uh, you, you react. And most of the time, we'll find some place to, uh, for vehicles to cross each other. So. It's more robust to uncertainty than planning, uh, but very uh, widely used uh, in swarm multi-agent systems and so on. Unfortunately, uh, since there is no anticipation, it's very difficult to have any uh, uh, certainty, for example, to have proof that your system will not get a deadlock, like we have seen in the roundabout. Or you can go uh, even better to game uh, theory, and you say, OK, uh, it's a game. Uh, do I go first or the other one? Uh, on it, it works. However, it's extremely difficult to design a, a good uh, reward uh, function. A reward function is a difficult function. It's uh, for two policies to give the reward uh, of the, the pair of policies. Uh, and so finally, it's, it's extremely difficult to handle. Practically, what people want to do on what we have done is to use a model predictive control, so it's a simple optimization, numerical optimization, plus some logical rules, and it's, it's what is done in, in many, many uh, autonomous cars. And with that, uh, you can uh, uh, really have a real-time system. And so can we have guarantees, in, uh, generally? Uh, uh, in best effort approaches or reactive approaches, uh, it's, there is no way to have any guarantee. It's the same uh, for learning. Uh, you, you, you 
may want to learn out, the other people will do, but it's learning, so if there is something you have not learned, uh, you cannot react properly. So that's all. Um, so it's extremely difficult to have any guarantee, but still, uh, what we absolutely don't want is to have any collision. So it's something we want to avoid at any cost. But also, we would like to avoid uh, uh, congestion, on especially gridlocks. We don't want to have, a, an, to have an intersection where you have three, four cars building a complete deadlock because it's extremely inefficient at the end. So, obviously, uh, you will see that uh, having mathematical guarantees uh, rely on strong hypotheses, uh, but still, uh, it teaches us how to design the system. So, I will, I will go fast. So we have simplified, uh, we are simplifying a lot. So if I take a real intersection now, like this one, uh, uh, just this one, not the, the other part of the intersection. Uh, so we will model the intersection with a controlled area, some uh, predefined uh, path, and then the cars driving along the path. Um, so it's much simpler than the reality, very clearly. Still. Uh, it remains complex. So a PhD student of mine did this nice simulation with the result of our research. And you see, even though it's much simpler than reality, uh, you have a lot of complexity. It's still a very complex system. So you can play here, you see they are reacting, uh, but they are planning, in fact they are all planning their trajectories on reacting uh, to some incoming events in case they have to give uh, priority to some of the cars. So, how we go from two cars uh, to uh, any, uh, any cars? So, simply you have to change your binary choice uh, to a priority graph, meaning it's a graph because for any two pair of vehicle, you need to set uh, one or minus one, uh, so it's a symmetric uh, matrix, uh, depending on how you say, or anti-symmetric. Um, so, it's uh, a graph. Uh, describing how uh, you manage the priorities, the directed graph. Uh, what, what the good news uh, is with uh, such a graph, you can prove mathematically that you can encode uh, all trajectories this way. So meaning once you have uh, uh, your complete family of graphs, you have no other possibility of trajectory. So you have described any possibility. And you can show that if you have two similar automatic tra trajectories, you have the same priority graph, but much better if you have two different priority, if you have two different automatic trajectories, you will have also different priority graphs. So it's a it's a one-to-one -one mapping uh, between uh, the automatic classes on uh, the priority graph. So that was the PhD of, of Jean. Uh, much better, theoretically, you can also describe uh, all uh, blockings uh, and you say that the deadlock finally, so I put here the mathematical formula, so don't try to understand. Uh, but what it tells you is simply that there is a condition about the cycles. You need to have a cycle. So if your graph has cycles, then you may have some uh, deadlock. But if you have no cycle, for example, if you have a direct acyclic graph, then it's impossible to have any deadlock. So finally, we have found a way to build uh, priorities between the cars, avoiding any deadlock. And that's a very uh, convenient uh, theorem, because it's extremely difficult otherwise to prove a system cannot go into a deadlock. So we can. So now we can interpret our theory. What we can do to find an optimal uh, uh, scenario is uh, to enumerate all priorities, and you have a finite number of them uh, because uh, the, the graph is finite for n cars, and you have only a binary choice for each, uh, uh, each edge of the graph. Uh, then uh, you check, uh, because there is a mathematical condition, if this class is blocking or not. So you throw it away if it's blocking, and if it's not blocking, you can perform a continuous optimization within this amateur class. It's very easy with numerical methods. And then you take simply the best of all uh, priorities and we learn how to build an optimal trajectory in terms of cooperation. Now there are still some problems. 
with that. It's theoretical. Because you know it's a, a, you have a matrix of, of bits, 0 or 1, and there are n, n minus 1 divided by 2 possibilities to set 1 or 0. So at the end, you have 2 to n, n minus 1. So it's more than exponential, much more. So even if you take uh, 20 cars, uh, it's absolutely intractable with modern computers. It's absolutely impossible just to enumerate all priorities with 20 cars. I'm not talking about the roundabout, you see? So just forget about this algorithm. It's a purely theoretical algorithm. So now practically, what we can do? So what we have learned is if you can build a trajectory, meaning uh, you, you plan a, a set of trajectories, in that case, what it means, uh, since all the trajectories go completely through the intersection, it means this homotopy class is non-blocking. And what it means is any uh, trajectory you would build within this homotopy class with the same uh, priority graph, it will be always non-blocking because the blocking uh, property is a property of the homotopy class, of the environment. So you can change uh, within this homotopy class, you will never block the system. So that's also a very good uh, property. And what we also we have learned in the, the homotopy class, it's a set of trajectories that is pretty huge. It's a very large set of trajectories so that we can build a control uh, within uh, this set of trajectories. Um, we have built uh, something we have called a priority aware control, meaning it's priority aware because it stays all the time within the priority uh, graph within the homotopy class. But it's still a control, so it's reactive. And now you see how we can do. We have built a control, so it's a real control, but where you take into account, question? Excuse me? Why are the homotopy classes important? Uh, because when you do control, uh, most of the time, uh, you uh, accelerate or decelerate uh, continuously. It means your trajectory are, are deformed uh, continuously, and it means you stay always uh, within uh, one homotopy class. Now, uh, I, I don't have time to explain you, but if you accelerate or decelerate uh, in a wrong way, uh, you can end up with uh, um, going into uh, non-feasible uh, trajectories. So typically, if you have two cars going like that, or two, with two cars, it's very difficult to build a deadlock. But with three cars, you can build a triangle. And so in that case, uh, you're outside uh, of your homotopy class because these trajectories will never end. But with some uh, rules, uh, you can avoid uh, exiting uh, your homotopy class. And with the control, uh, you will always stay within a, an homotopy class in principle. Uh, it's more complex than that, but uh, let's say it's true. So now what we want to do, uh, to do cooperative control, is simply to choose a good priority. So it's a problem of priority assignment. You want to assign a priority to each vehicle. And then, uh, so it's a combinatorial problem that's well structured. I will explain a little bit later why. And then you compute a control uh, for all costs, respecting that priority. So it puts, in fact, new constraints, logical constraints, uh, uh, on your uh, control. And you are even able to build something that breaks a robust control, meaning that if any subset of the cars suddenly break, all the other cars can react and break safely. And it's a very difficult property because if you typically, when you follow cars on the motorway, if you have sufficient space, uh, uh, the, if there is a sudden deceleration, you have time to decelerate because they decelerate in the same direction. When you're in a, a perpendicular direction, uh, and if you want to optimize, the problem is if you optimize, you will go just after the first car. But if it decelerates a little bit, it's like a brick wall because you, have, you cannot pass just after. So it's like having an infinite deceleration. And so it's very difficult uh, to build a system that is aware of this possible deceleration. But, but it's, it's feasible. So I just say it's feasible. So back, in, back to practice now. How to exploit our mathematical guarantees? Because very clearly, real life is not like that. So uh, what is 
still true is whatever you, you do at an intersection, each vehicle has to pass before or after the other car. So it's mainly true even if you relax lots of assumptions, you have to pass after or before, and that's the main challenge. So finally, all of what we have learned, you, have, you may have to change a little bit your constraints and so on to adapt to real life traffic, but what we have learned is how to deform trajectories, meaning slowing down or accelerating and sa safely, so avoiding any collision, all together, because now we have our graph, and this graph gives, finally, the way if I decelerate, how the, so what are the other cars that will be impacted by my own decision, that's a graph, and also how they should behave, so both. And so we can implement that, and you have seen uh, the short video. Um, the main problem now is not the control, so the control part of it is rather, is rather easy. What is very difficult is to build a good cooperation, because you can have extremely inefficient priorities. Typically, if you have two cars, one question is, uh, should I let the car pass before me or after me? On imagine you have priority to the right, so very uh, common in Europe, continental Europe. Uh, the stupid question is how far is this rule uh, true? So if the two cars uh, arrive, uh, and the, the car arriving from the right is say uh, 20 meters from the intersection, very clearly uh, you will stop because it has to pass first. Now if it's 50 meters before the intersection, you can think, but if it's one kilometer away from the intersection, we, you will never give uh, right of way to this, to this car. It would be stupid. So the, the, the bad question is really how far does this roll hold? And it's a question completely related to how do you build uh, your priorities. And if you're stupid, uh, then you give uh, right of way to a very distant car, and then everybody will wait a long time for that to happen, and then all the other cars can continue to go through the intersection. Um, so that's very difficult. Um, so practically, we have implemented in real car this algorithm, so it works, uh, uh, because we can build an uh, uh, MPC controller, so a numerical optimization of uh, trajectories. And um, we have the right uh, constraints to put additionally in every car uh, to obtain uh, a kind of cooperative control. But still, uh, <clears throat> an additional benefit of that uh, is that we know how to build a minimalistic uh, information system because you only have to send uh, one bit of information for every pair of cars. So finally, for one car, you have one vector of bits stating, uh, do I have priority or not? So it's a very simple uh, system on, in terms of communicate connected cars, uh, it's very suitable, it's much more efficient than, for example, sending complete trajectories to the other cars. Much more efficient. So, in terms of perspective, uh, what is difficult now is to compute an efficient priority. Uh, optimal is out of reach because it's combinatorial, but heuristic uh, could be feasible. I have to stop at Five or ten minutes before? For questions, it's good to leave some time, so ten minutes before. Okay, so I still have two or three minutes. So I will go fast. Uh, just to tell you, it's very easy, so not straightforward, but it's not very difficult to enlarge theory to other cases like multiple lanes, roundabout, and so on. So it's, it's, it's the same ideas you can apply to different contexts. Uh, you can also design uh, some protocols uh, to, uh, to do that. <clears throat> but now you have two problems. One is uh, uh, the priority assignment itself. If you take n cars, how you choose your priority graph. But now there is also another question. When do you take the decision? But again, if in, in this model, you take the decision once for all, at the beginning, at time zero. But in real life, you don't want to take the decision at time zero, because if you have a car that you see 200 meters away, and you insert it in a <coughs> common decision, and then suddenly you see another car so that was just behind a truck or something, you would like to adapt. So you shouldn't take the decision too early. So there is also a very difficult question, is when to take the decision. Um, 
uh, it's very, it's almost sure, huh? there is no theorem for that, it's almost sure that it really depends on your uncertainties. So you need to have now not only deterministic model like I have, but you need to have uh, probabilistic models, so it's an additional difficulty. And so in conclusion, so I will finally pass the second part of my talk. Um, in conclusion, we have a theoretical analysis on its one analysis. You could have other analysis for cooperative systems. There are many other ways to handle cooperation between autonomous cars. But it increases substantially our understanding because at least you know now that uh, whatever you do, uh, in terms of control, uh, you should stay uh, within uh, your autonomy class because your trajectories are, are deformed continuously. And so there are some things that you can do and some things that you cannot do even with other theories. So you can confront other point of views. Also, uh, very important, we much better understand the ties between the planning phase, the control phase, and the time when you take the decision. So now, in real life, maybe you get rid uh, of the difficult question of priority graph because it's a very difficult question, but still you understand that um, giving some priorities, not all maybe, on that having a control where you take into account the constraints of these priorities will enhance a lot uh, the behavior of your system. So it's, it's a way also for me not to follow completely what I have said, uh, but to, to, to manage better your systems. And it has a, a, a very uh, a great influence uh, onto the rest of the system, especially perception communication. For example, in terms of perception, if you know the white car has to go after the blue car, it means the blue car can forget about the white car. Because if they have agreed, uh, the blue car has nothing to do uh, with the blue car. Now, the blue car, uh, excuse me, the white car, it has to follow carefully the white car because then it can accelerate. So in terms of perception system, it has an impact. It also has an impact in terms of communication because as I emphasized, the kind of information you have to communicate on, to, to the, on the car to which you want to communicate is really given uh, as a pattern uh, by, by the algorithm I, I've told you. So it would be a dedicated cooperative framework and I will not go to the semantic part of it. And so thank you for your attention. I believe I can do, sure. Jump to the end, oops, sorry. So up. Did we not get the cartoon? Ah, oh, the cartoon, excuse me. <coughs> And it's not a joke. Uh, some people uh, now have stated that with autonomous cars, we would have much more traffic jams than today. For two reasons, because they are very cautious, so they don't respect the two second interspace between cars. Uh, on Paris, a uh, peripheral uh, around Paris, uh, I believe the average is 1.2 or 1.3 seconds. And everybody knows that if uh, the People, if police would enforce the two seconds, uh, the traffic would be completely blocked uh, seven hours a day, blocked. So better not introduce too early uh, autonomous cars. On second, uh, if you have autonomous cars, you can redeploy uh, your autonomous cars with nobody on board. Uh, and one of the main uh, criteria of efficiency of your system is the number of passengers per car, and it's 1.1, I believe. So you can go below one, if you have empty cars. Um, it's also crucial because robots are extremely patient. So they can wait uh, three hours in a traffic jam uh, and they don't care. But you care if you're just after them. <laughs> so that's very important. So thank you.